Shift Show. Well, we've been flirting with that $1,300 level all year. I've been talking about all the resistance that was up there, and every time the price of gold got near $1,300, it was met with tremendous amounts of selling. There was a lot of supply, but as I've been saying on this podcast, the demand was building. This was a coiled spring. We continued to see more and more buying beneath the market. The channel was narrowing. The distance between the 1,300 resistance and the support kept getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And I said I was looking at it, and I thought it was only a matter of time before we exhausted all that supply and broke through that $1,300 level, that psychological level, but also a level with a tremendous amount of selling. And we finally did it today up about $18, $19 on the day. We closed at about thirteen ten. Finally, I think maybe there were people that were worried that we wouldn't hold that level. People were thinking that we would sell off so we wouldn't quite get a close above $1,300. We'd just get a trade above $1,300. But the rally held firm all day long. We actually closed on the highs of the day. And in fact, as I'm recording this podcast early in the evening session, The price of gold is taking another jump. Maybe the catalyst is this uh, missile that I guess North Korea fired that maybe went through Japanese airspace. And so we're tacking on another 10, 11 bucks. We're now trading above 1320 on the price of gold. You know, the dollar continued its weakness. This was one of the reasons that gold continues to be strong. Dollar index made new lows today down around 92.20. And looking at the action so far, Uh, in the early evening, the dollar is not benefiting at all from this flight to quality. We're seeing a big rise in the Japanese yen, a big rise in the Swiss franc. Those are the go-to currencies. Those are the safe haven currencies. The dollar is now a risk asset. People don't buy the dollar when they're worried. They sell the dollar when they're worried. They buy it when they just want to take risk and they think something is going up. Even the Chinese yuan, new high for the year. Rallying again tonight as a safe haven from the U.S. dollar. Of course, gold now is not only rising in terms of dollars, but it's finally rising in terms of everything. The dollar is now going up in yen terms. It's going up in Swiss franc terms, even though those currencies are rising as well. This is a key factor. And I think now that we have cleared out that resistance, there are a lot of people that thought there was no upside in gold. Well, they're about to find out just how much upside there was. I think, of course, even bigger moves are coming in the gold stocks. I mean, these gold stocks still, they were up today. Uh, The uh, GDX was up 3.6%. GDXJ, junior gold miners, up 3.8%. But these stocks still have a long way to go. Maybe tomorrow will be their big day. We'll see. Now that we closed above 1,300, we will gap up uh, maybe well above it tomorrow. These stocks have a lot of lost ground to make up for. They should be a lot higher They're not because everybody was so sure that the price of gold was not going to rise above 1300. And again, everybody's been waiting for the dollar to rally. Everybody's been waiting for the Fed to hike rates. And none of this stuff is really happening. And I think people are starting to throw in a towel that they should have thrown in a long time ago when it comes to long the dollar, short gold, short silver. You know, I think another catalyst, too, that's going to help power this trade is the uh, the hurricane that we just had in Texas and all the damage, all the flooding in the Houston area. What is this going to mean? This is going to be major relief spending. You know, I think maybe one in six people had flood insurance in Houston. You know, one of the reasons that a lot of people don't buy the insurance is because they know if there's a big flood, they're going to qualify for federal disaster relief. So this whole thing is a gigantic moral hazard. And of course, the government even subsidizes low-cost flood insurance, so people will build in areas that they shouldn't even be building in. Uh, So this is going to be a major, major price tag, tens of billions of dollars, of course. And where is it going to come from? It's all going to be borrowed, right? All the Republicans in Texas, they're not going to want small government, right? Small government's going to go out the window. You know, all these guys in Texas who, oh, we're against aid uh, for New Jersey or, you know, from Hurricane Sandy. Oh, no, no, no. Now they're all going to want a government aid, government bailouts, uh, emergency relief money. Of course, all this is unconstitutional. You know, not that, you know, I, I don't care about people who have lost things. I'm per- certainly 
uh, believe that private charity uh, should be coming in there instead of the U.S. government. But of course, the government is going to do it because no politician can resist, uh, you know, being there, you know, uh, handing out goodies. I mean, talking about bringing all the federal resources in and helping the people. And now is not the time to talk politics. You know, I saw Ted Cruz up there today on television who, you know, did oppose some of the relief money. Uh, for Hurricane Sandy, when he's asked about that, oh, now's not the time to do politics. We got to put the people first. Whenever someone says that, it's all politics. Why do they want to put the people first? Because they want those people to vote for them. They want to act like they're the ones that are there to, to help everybody. They're providing all the relief. But where's all this money going to come from? It's all going to be borrowed. You know, do we have any money saved for a rainy day? No. And when it pours, like it just did in Texas, that means we have to pour on the debt. We have to borrow all this money. So all the Republicans are going to want to vote for aid for Texas. But you know what? The Democrats are going to want something for themselves, too, because they're going to support it. So they're going to probably want some spending in their districts. Maybe this will be the catalyst for that big infrastructure bonanza. And, of course, a lot of this money that's going to be spent in Texas is just going to be you know, looted. And all, everybody's going to have their hands in this government honeypot. It's just going to drive up the deficit. Of course, you're going to find some idiot Keynesian economist who's going to talk about how this is going to be good for GDP because we have to clean up the mess. We have to spend all this money. This is all nonsense. We have to spend money to replace what we already had. This makes us poor, right? You don't, you don't become richer because a, a hurricane you know, floods out an entire city. The money that you have to spend repairing the damage is money that you couldn't spend doing something else. So, you know, America, we can barely afford when we don't have a disaster. So this is simply going to add another problem. It's another weight uh, that's dragging the economy down deeper into this uh, abyss as we go more towards a recession. Also, it's going to help put more upward pressure on raw material prices, commodity prices, which continue to surge, industrial metals rising. Now, oil prices actually fell today. Gasoline prices rose but oil prices fell because they thought that a lot of these refineries are going to shut down. And so temporarily, there'll be some kind of a glut. But I think once this short term uh, period passes, I think this storm is going to be bullish for oil prices as well. We got commodities rising across the board. We got a weak dollar. We got the price of gold breaking out. I and mean, as far as I'm concerned, we've got the all clear. Right. I think my investment strategy now is firing on all cylinders. And, uh, you know, so again, as I've been saying on this podcast, move more money out of the U.S. stock market. You know, the S&P is only up about 9% this year. The price of gold is up about 14%. That means that gold is beating the S&P by about 50%. You wouldn't know that uh, from listening to the coverage, right? Everybody wants to talk about how great the stock market is. It's, you know, it's not even close to the performance of gold. But of course, foreign stocks are beating the price of gold, too. Because not only do you get the weakness in the dollar, but you get the appreciation in those stocks and you get the dividend yield because you get much better dividend yields abroad. And this is just beginning. This is just the beginning of a huge multi-year bull market in foreign stocks, in commodities and gold. And I think this breakout today could kick this thing off into a whole new gear. You know, so if you're a client of mine at Europe Pacific Capital, you know, make sure, add to your account, talk to your broker, find out how to add more funds into your account. If you've been listening to me all these years and you haven't opened up an account, what are you waiting for? You know, you know, the hard part is over. We've gone through the bear market, right? We've gone through the dollar rally. We've gone through the correction in gold and gold stocks. Now it's off to the races as far as I'm concerned. So it's a great time to start. You're not at the exact bottom, but it's a good time to start because mentally you're not going to have to deal, I think, with any kind of a big downturn. I think this, you know, the, the coast is clear now for years and years of, of of positive returns, right? Nothing's guaranteed, but this is my opinion. I think that I've I've never really seen the fundamentals and the technicals lined up so perfectly as what I'm looking at right now. So if you don't have an account, establish one. If you have an account, add to it. If you have money in the U.S. stock market, take that off the table. Pare back those risks. The U.S. stock market is expensive. Relative to foreign stocks, the dollar is overvalued and declining. So even if you're not a gloom and doomer, I mean, even if my doomsday scenario, right, of a, of a dollar crisis, of an economic crisis, even if it doesn't play out, 
You still should be investing internationally instead of in the U.S. You should still be getting out of the dollar. I mean, when the dollar declines, these declines last for years. They're, you know, you don't just see a one-year decline. And by the way, again, we're, we are on track to register the biggest uh, yearly decline since 1985. That started a 10-year dollar decline. So these cycles happen in waves. It's years and years and years. It's not quarters. And so we are just getting started. So even if it doesn't end in a crisis, it still makes sense to follow my investment strategy. But I am convinced that this will end in a crisis. And it's not going to be the type of crisis we had in 2008 where the dollar goes up. It's going to be the type of crisis where the dollar tanks. The dollar is going to be the crisis. And it's not just mortgages that are going to be going down. It's U.S. Treasuries. That's the debt that everybody's going to be dumping. That's what people are going to realize, that our debt is subprime, that we're broke that we can't afford to repay our debt in money that still has purchasing power. So it's going to be a sovereign debt crisis. It's going to be a currency crisis. Now, that crisis could still be years away. I don't know. But I think the dollar is going to surrender a lot of value between now and then. And who knows? This could happen in an accelerated time frame. You know, this phony dollar rally, this head fake that we had, has really set us up for a spectacular fall. And politically, you know, you had hopes really elevated that we were going to get some huge change under Trump. We were going to drain the swamp. We were going to make America great again. And when people realize that, you know, we just poured more water into that swamp, that we're not making America great again. We're making the the debt greater, that we're simply doubling down on the failed policies of Bush and Obama. Uh, Things could come ungraveled very, very quickly. And so I, you know, I, I wouldn't press my luck. I would try to move forward Uh, with this as quickly as possible. But I wanted to finish up this podcast just by going over a bit of a controversy that has resulted in Puerto Rico based on some of my comments that I made on the Joe Rogan podcast. And of course, if you haven't seen the Joe Rogan podcast, check it out. I mean, it's two hours and 45 minutes. uh, So it's a long, uh, it's a long podcast. You can listen to it. You can watch it on on YouTube, but we started out the podcast by talking about Puerto Rico, and I really didn't realize that we were going to spend so much time on the topic of of Puerto Rico. But as a result of that conversation, all of a sudden I started a big controversy because a lot of very popular people, social media wise, I mean, people that have a million followers on what Facebook or Instagram, Twitter, a couple of really popular people in Puerto Rico started focusing in on one particular point that I made, which became very controversial. Now, you know, I talked about the fact that the socialists wrecked the Puerto Rican economy, that it would be a disaster for Puerto Rico to become a state. I said a lot of things that you might have thought would have been controversial, but that's not what everybody is making a big deal about. Uh, um, Joe Rogan asked me about, you know, the people that work for me and how their, their transition was like when they moved out to uh to puerto rico and i said everything was fine you know he thought maybe it was a tough sell especially since everybody moved from southern california but i mentioned that you know i have one of the guys that works for me is married has some kids and you know they're in my community in dorado and you know they're really enjoying it uh but that i have three single guys portfolio managers that all live in you know condado area around um, san juan and i mentioned that they were really enjoying a puerto rican life and i you know i mentioned uh, that they had a lot of beautiful women in Puerto Rico, that I think there's been five Miss Universes from that small uh, uh, you know, island. So very nice looking women. And I mentioned, and by the way, you know, they have jobs. And I said, that's a big plus down there because a lot of Puerto Rican men are unemployed, right? Which is true. They have very, very high unemployment in the island. So I thought, hey, you know, if you're down there and you got a job that, you know, that makes it easier for you to uh, to get a date. And apparently this became a big controversy. Now I'm a big sexist. I'm, you know, I'm saying that Puerto Rican women are just what they're, they're, they're whores. I mean, they're just, they're, they're just selling themselves to guys who have money that they only want to date guys that have jobs. And like somehow I'm insulting a Puerto Rican women. I mean, first of all, I, I wasn't making these comments to, to, to relate just to Puerto Rican women. I mean, I'm talking about women in general. The fact that women prefer to date guys with jobs. I mean, why should that be a controversial statement? I mean, first of all, it's true, but why should it be controversial? And what's wrong with wanting to date a guy who's got a job? I mean, do you think women want to date bums? Do you think women want to date guys who just live with their parents? I mean, women want to go out with a guy, A, that can take them out, right? I mean, because still today, most men 
are picking up the cost of a date. You ask a girl out on a date, you pick up the check, you take her out to dinner, right? So if you have a job, well, you can afford to go to a nicer restaurant. So, I mean, wouldn't a gal want to go on a, to a nice restaurant date? Of course she wants to go to a nice restaurant, right? So, yes, it, it is a plus when you're competing with other men for women, and that's what men do, right? We all compete for women, and this is not unique to humans, right? All the species pretty much on the planet, males are competing with one another for the attention of females, right? So the females get to choose, and the men are trying to, you know, outdo other men to win the the attention of the female, right? And, you know, a lot of this is biological, too. There's a lot of stuff that goes into this. I don't need to get into a a genetics lesson or biology lesson, but we all know that this is the way life works. And obviously, if you got a job, that's, you know, that's a, a big factor in making a guy more appealing to a woman, right? Because why does she want to date a guy a, if you don't have a job, there's a good chance you're still living at home. I mean, it's not, I mean, a girl doesn't need a guy that's still living with his parents. I mean, for obvious reasons, you want, she wants a guy with his own place, right? So if she goes over there, she's, she's not with, with the guy's family, with his parents. He's like an adult. He has his own place because, you know, maybe she still lives with her parents and she wants to escape from that. She wants, you know, some privacy. She doesn't want to be in the backseat of some car. She wants to be in, in an apartment. And, of course, you know, if a guy's got a job, he can afford to take her out on nicer dates. I mean, why do you think so many young girls, right, so many college girls or girls in their early 20s, why are they dating guys in their 30s or even in their 40s? Because these guys have jobs. These guys have money, right? I mean, so it's tough now when you're 20-something and living with your parents and you got a bunch of debt. It's hard to get a date because all the women that you should be dating are dating older guys because you've got nothing to offer other than your youth. And for most women... Youth is not a big deal. I mean, men desire that, right? Men desire young, beautiful women. But in general, women, I mean, you know, that takes a back seat. And of course, you know, whenever a woman is going out on a date, all these dates are job interviews for a husband, right? Women are looking to get married, to settle down, most of them, right? Not all of them, right? But in general, women want, you know, to get married and to have kids. And so they need somebody who can help support those kids, help support her. So obviously having a job is a good indication that you may be able to provide those things. If you're unemployed, then you really can't do it. I mean, think about it this way. I mean, we all have been in these situations. I mean, if, if a guy is trying to, um, you know, set up his friend with a girl, like a blind date, although those are kind of hard now because the minute you find out her name, you're, you know, looking her up on Instagram or Facebook. But in general, if a guy is going to tell his buddy, Hey, I, there's, I got this gal. Um, I, I'd really like to set you up with her. The first question that he's going to ask is, what does she look like? Right? That's the number one question. What does she look like? And he might start asking specifically you know, about her body. But that's going to be the first thing that the guy's going to ask. Then, he, you know, then he'll ask some other questions. But if you take a girl who is going to set up one of her girlfriends with some guy, the first question is going to be, what does he do? Right? What's his job? That's what she's going to ask, right? Now, then she's going to say, well, what's his personality like? Does he have a good sense of humor? Is he cute? She's going to get to that stuff. But the first thing is, what does he do? In fact, I'm sure if a woman just starts dating a guy and she calls her mother to say, hey, mom, I'm dating this new guy, the first thing the mother's going to say is, what does he do? What does he do for a living? What's his job, right? This is something that women care about. They care about it a lot more than men do. This is not, shouldn't be controversial. There's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with women caring about the ability of a man to be a provider. And of course, you know, women are also attracted to a lot of these characteristics. They like a guy who is successful. They like somebody who has some experience that has maybe some power. Remember what was uh, Scarface, right? First you get the, the money, then you get the power, then you get the women, right? I mean, you can argue whether you get the power before the money or the money before the power, but the women come last, right? Once you have all that stuff, it makes you actually more attractive. And in fact, in a way, that actually shows that women, you know, are, you know, are, are deeper. I mean, men, it's all about the way they look initially, right? To say that if a woman is attracted to a guy's accomplishments, to the fact that the guy has been able to achieve things. I mean, that to me, that's deeper than than this, us guys who would, you know, look who care what 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 the woman what the woman looks like. 
But the fact that all of a sudden I made these comments as if somehow I'm insulting the women of Puerto Rico. First of all, Puerto Rican women are no different than anybody else. And nor did I even, you know, you know, say that they were any different. They're just being women. And of course, if you're a woman and you want to go out on a date, you want the guy who's taking you out on a date to have a job. And since there's a lot of unemployment in Puerto Rico because of big government and a lot of things like that, then if you have a job, that means, and a lot of other Puerto Rican men don't, then that means you have less competition, right? Because that, 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 those are a lot of uh, guys that girls just don't want to date because they, they just don't have jobs. And, and so that was one of the positives that I saw for somebody moving to Puerto Rico now is that would give you a leg up on the competition, which, of course, is what men are looking for right men are looking to find women to go out with they're looking to find women to marry and to the extent that you know a lot of the other men are unemployed well if you come to puerto rico and you have a job that's an advantage that might that might be a better advantage than you might have in the u.s where the unemployment rate is lower and and, and a higher percentage of the guys have jobs but somehow i went into this you know territory and again it's like this political correctness right i said something that wasn't politically correct because i pretended uh, that maybe there was a difference between men or women or that women care about things like the guy having a job. Now, of course, that doesn't mean they're just money grubbing gold diggers. I mean, there are a lot of other things that go with having a job. Like you you have some ambition that you're a go getter, right, that you that you're tenacious, that you're hardworking. I mean, these are all important characteristics that a woman is looking for in a boyfriend, in a husband. And so the fact that someone's just content with being a bum and, and, and living in his parents' basement is going to turn off a lot of women. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing sexist about that. I, I, I'm not going to apologize for having said that. In fact, if any of these big bloggers in, 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 in Puerto Rico, if I, if I ever, maybe I'll get back there, maybe I'll try to go on some local Puerto Rican television. But I won't apologize for what I said. I'll just explain why what I said is true. And there's no reason that you can't speak the truth. I mean, that's the whole part of political correctness that so, is so annoying is when you're forced to deny things that are true just because somebody else might take offense to it. Somebody else doesn't think it's you know the politically correct position to take. Well, I'm sorry if some people are offended by reality, right? but that is reality. Rather than denying things that we know are true, we need to accept them and we need to understand them. Because you're not going to make any progress if you just try to deny things that are true, right? And you're going to try to uh, forget about that. Because as it says, when it comes to things like, you know, fighting poverty or crime in, in, uh, you know, in the inner cities, if we're going to ignore the real cause of these problems and focus on some Civil War monuments and say that's why we're having problems, that's why we have unemployment. That's why we have crime. Let's just take down these monuments, right? And things are going to get better. You are wasting your time. You are diverting your resources from where they should be. And you are distracting people's attention from the real cause of the problems. And you're creating this phony uh, excuse and you're conjuring up racism that doesn't exist as if that is the reason. And you create this victimhood mentality that prevents people from actually lifting themselves out of poverty and getting to the root cause of the problem. And to the extent that people in Puerto Rico are upset with me because I'm saying the truth, what they really need to do is take a look at the mirror and understand, you know, to the extent that there are problems in Puerto Rico, what they are. And rather than making a big deal out of the fact that I'm saying that women prefer to date guys that have jobs, let's try to figure out why there aren't more employed guys for those girls to date. What is the real reason that there's so much unemployment in Puerto Rico? Let's deal with that, not the nonsense over whether or not, you know, it's an insult to women by pointing out the obvious fact that women value a man who has a good job and can support her potential family should they decide to get married.